No, 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 no. He seems to be covering COVID, yet he doesn't understand placebo or double blind experiments. This is like, this is like critiquing motocross and not knowing that there's an engine inside inside the motorcycles. Or this is like- As, as random chance. Oh! One of you suggested that I check out this video and I do a reaction. So here we go. Dr. John Campbell, you need to know this. Let's do this. Hello there, you five million glorious miracles. Thanks for joining me on this channel. This is a video you're gonna love. I spoke to Dr. John Campbell, who used to be a nurse and indeed trained nurses and has a PhD. And his channel where he talks about coronavirus pandemic and the various um, mutations, permutations, regulations, but primarily the medical connotations and, and analyzes medical data has been a total sensation. I watch his videos myself. I know loads of you do. Let me know in the comments below if you do watch Dr. John's channel. He's a fantastic fantastic guy, a brilliant communicator, trustworthy, and in my opinion, stays super objective. On the full Luminary podcast, Under the Skin, which is on you know Luminary, where I do my podcast, we talk in depth about what's been going on in the last couple of years. In the part of the conversation that I'm willing to put on YouTube, we talk about double blind science tests. Do you even know what that means, a double blind science test? I bet you don't, do you? A double blind uh, science experiment is where the patient uh, and the people come controlling the test don't know um, uh, the results, so they don't know who they're giving the medication to. And the reason why this is important, there's also triple blind experiments. And the reason why this is important is because um, there could be some subjective um, cue that the person gives, uh, that the doctor may give away or the researchers may give away when they're giving the patient a placebo. Or they might ask leading questions or they might have a certain type of body language. Uh, a double blind experiment or a triple blind experiment ensures that that can't happen. So. I bet you've been pretending to know. I bet you've been using that phrase. What is a double blind science test? He talks about how things are clinically trialed. He talks about the power of placebos. It's a fantastic conversation. You're going to love it. Stay to the end and hit me up in the comments about what you think of this chat. Objectivity is. You've got to appreciate um, Russell Brand for his uh, charisma amazing charisma, but um, sometimes I worry that charisma gets in the way of people uh, understanding the, the world for how it truly is. Really quite difficult intrinsically in pharmacology because whenever you put forward an idea in pharmacology, you'll always get someone who says, well, where are the randomized double blind controlled trials on this? So if you're talking about hydroxychloroquine or you're talking about ivermectin, for example, as an early treatment, people will say, well, where's the large scale randomized double blind controlled trials on this? Well, there isn't any. Can you just sure. tell me what a randomized double blind sure. trial is, please? Sure, 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 sure. So if you want to know if a new drug works, you have to have a clinical trial to see if it works. This is the experiment. So you want you want a few thousand people who are actually getting a new drug and a few thousand people who are not getting the new drug. But the point is, if you've got a few thousand people and you say to them, well, I'm giving you this new sophisticated drug and we think it's probably going to make you better, they'll think, oh, I'm getting a new sophisticated drug. It's probably going to make me better. And the fact that they think that makes is going to make them better is likely to make them better in itself. That just that belief. And He's explaining placebo and um, Russell Brand already looks blown that's away. That's well recognised. That's called the placebo effect. But then if you say to another group of people, well, we're doing this clinical trial and those group of people over there, they're getting some nice, sophisticated new treatment. Whereas you, you're just getting a sugar pill. You're just getting a placebo. You're just a control. You're not as important. Now, not only will those people not have the placebo effect, they could actually believe that's making them worse and have, have what's called a nocebo effect. So we have to have two groups. And it's absolutely vital that who goes into those groups is randomized. So if you imagine, could you have all men in one group and all women in another group? Well, obviously not. Could you have young people in one group and older people in another group? Well, obviously not. Could you have people with heart disease and smokers in one group and non-heart disease and non-smokers in the other group? Again, you would be comparing apples and oranges. You have to compare like with like. So you can think about things like male, female, age, body mass index, smoking status, heart disease. And you could, you could allocate people to one group or other, the experimental group getting the drug or the placebo group based on that but of course then there's thousands of things that you don't know about so the only way to compare like with like is to randomize it so you must have randomization either to the experimental group or the control group and then it has to be blind to get rid of this placebo and nocebo effect 
And the only way you make it blind is you have the drug looks the same. It is, like it does help that. But the point is to make sure that the um, practitioners or the people who are the researchers who are giving this medication aren't inev um, inevitably pushing on some of their biases. Um, it's not necessarily like it's a it's a it's a safeguard to make sure that the placebo slash nocebo um, trials work well. The same, and the placebo looks the same. And that means the patients are blind. So the patients don't know whether they're getting the drug and they don't know whether they're getting the placebo. They don't know. And as well as that, it has to be double blind. And if it's double blind, that means the nurses and the doctors giving the treatment don't know whether they're giving the active treatment or where they're giving the placebo. Because if I go into a patient's cubicle who's sick and uh, I, I give them a drug and I know that's the drug, they're going to be able to read that in me to some extent. And, and the people interpreting the results mustn't know whether it's actually the drug or not. That means it's all objective, all object, or it, it promotes. The placebo effect can actually work with dogs as well. Um, like if you give uh, an animal a, a real drug versus a placebo, it can like you, you can need to double blind those experiments as well, <laughs> which is amazing. It's objectivity. So that means it's a randomized that you have to be random allocation, mathematical random allocation as to who goes into what group. So it's randomized. It's got to be double blind. So the patients and the staff and the people interpreting the results don't know who's in which group. So it's a randomized double blind. It's controlled because the control group are not getting the active treatment. And it's a clinical trial. And that is the gold standard of working out what treatments are. That's but the first time I've ever understood that. Thank you. <laughs> does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, it really does. You really broke that down. I'm like one of them nurses from, from your VHS days. I, I get it now. Thank it's much you. easier if I can draw on a whiteboard at the same I time. That. I've got to tell you, I missed the cutaway of the fountain pen. That's killing me now. My understanding that, hang on a sec, Russell Brand like does a lot of these, like talks a lot about science on his channel, doesn't he? This is a problem for all of us. Sad to believe this is happening. Truck protest goes, hold the line. So he, he seems to be covering, <laughs> no, no. I mean, I'm, I haven't watched any of these videos as you can see, but like, no, 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 no. He seems to be covering COVID and the coronavirus. They hate you. This goes deeper than you know. This is a real problem. With the Pfizer logo, they lied, the impossible to ignore, they are distracting you. Now it makes sense. Vaccine passport, what do you think? It's it's clear, <laughs> it's clear what his uh his uh, at least his thumbnails, what message his thumbnails are, are trying to produce. Yet he doesn't understand placebo or double blind experiments. What? This is like this is like critiquing motocross and not knowing that there's an engine inside the vehicle, in like inside the in, inside the motorcycles. Or this is like, this is like, this is like trying to play the golf in a forest. What? This doesn't make any sense. Baby powder. If you can't offer that, it's safe. Like I don't know what else you can offer for a baby powder. It's baby powder. Baby powder has got to be safe. Now, the idea that Johnson & Johnson are trying to file for bankruptcy, presumably through some sub-corporation or whatever, to avoid paying out 38,000 claims, that's not exactly the kind of reassuring attitude that I would expect from someone who's a player on a global scale. I'm not naive, stupid enough to suggest that Johnson & Johnson would necessarily have malpractice in every area of their business. I wouldn't suggest that unless there's bloody evidence. Here, 38,000 lawsuits, that's evidence, right? So if we look through his comments, are we going to see a bunch of people crying conspiracy? Or are we going to see some people who are articulating a, a reasoned approach to this kind of, um, I won't say misinformation, but it appears that way. I'm so relieved that I have people like you to remind me that I'm not insane. The world is gaslighting us all. I've been called fam uh, crazy by my family members and friends because I've been saying this since the beginning. If you've been saying this since the beginning, and this is new evidence, then you are unjustified in the beginning, even if this, was, if this new evidence is, in fact, uh, correct in its assumption of what the video title is. If, if you've been saying this since the beginning, you were saying it unjustifiably at the beginning. If this is true, which I, I doubt it is. 
34 years old, but I have to say, in a word that's gone mad with power, greed, and the, and fear. Thank God for every. Oh my gosh, speaking the truth. Okay. I get the vibe of where uh, where uh, Mr. Russell Brand is going. Not having that. Oh, um, yeah. I've got, I've got it here. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the thing whiskey. I wanted to say is with regard to the double blind component of this experimental uh, process. Controlled trial, yeah. yeah. Does that not in itself indicate that the power of consciousness and innate healing propensities oh, within our yeah. nature is so powerful that science has to sort of blanket it out? Absolutely. You could just tell people... Get better. <laughs> get better. Absolutely. The, the placebo effect can do things that are apparent miracles. And more ominously, Russell, the nocebo effect can as well. So if people believe, for example, in witch doctors, and the witch doctor says, I put a curse on you, and the person who's had the curse put on them actually believe that, then that belief will make them sick. It's called the nocebo effect. So when I was young and foolish, I took an interest in uh, mushrooms. And, you madman. Uh, yeah, absolute insanity. I was about, I must have been about 20 or something like that. I was taking, so I went out and picked some mushrooms and I learned to identify psilocybin mushrooms. And I thought, well, I'll just take a couple of those and see what happens. So I took a couple of these psilocybin mushrooms. Now, I'm not advocating this, never done it again, confessed and repented, but all that's finished. <laughs> I, I never took enough to have any real effect anyway. But then I thought, you know, I wonder if those mushrooms, I think some of those mushrooms I picked had white gills underneath them, which would make them poisonous. Now, they didn't. I'd pick the right ones because I was very careful about it. But then I came to believe that I'd eaten a, a poisonous mushroom. And that made me start feeling really, really ill. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a physiological effect. It was just my belief, and I had to take advice to point that out. I mean, it's, it, he's probably right um, in that, but it's funny because what he's advocating for now, um, you would actually, to, to actually test this, you'd need to, to, to test what he's saying here, you'd actually need it to run, run it as a placebo controlled trial because it's, it's a high, po highly possibility that psilocybin might make people feel nauseous anyway. So, you know. He's, he's drawing a conclusion. It's probably correct and under my understanding, but he'd still need to do a run a uh, placebo controlled experiment. To I'll find point that out. out that I wasn't ill. So, so, so a, nocebo, a, a nocebo effect can make you ill. A placebo effect can make you better. And, and, and really quite dramatically. Now, clinical trials have been done on this where you can actually separate out the active drug from the placebo effect. So w when I give you a painkiller, if you come into my A&E department and I give you 10 milligrams of morphine, for example, for your pain, then about 70% of the beneficial effect you will experience is as a result of the pharmacology of the morphine. About 30% of that is because you believe I've given you an effective painkiller. So it's actually been identified as around about 30% in the field of analgesia. And there's a placebo effect in, in absolutely everything. That's why whether you're looking at surgery, whether you're looking at wound healing, whether you're looking at treating heart disease, whether you're looking at treating brain disease, kidney disease, you always have to have this randomized double blind component. Otherwise, you can't get objective results. There, there was actually a really interesting study um, run by the Templeton Foundation. And I might get some of the information a little bit cloudy, but it was an interesting study because they studied intercessory prayer. They had three different organization um, churches and they were praying for certain people by name uh, for at a certain amount of time and they would intercede for them. And all these people had the same level of heart disease. Um, they're going in for heart disease surgery and they were the same category of um, being sick. I'm going to screw this up, but essentially the Templeton Foundation experiment showed that the group, well, it was a small causation, but they found that the group that thought they were being prayed for and were being prayed for actually did worse in recovery. Um, and the reason they hypothesize in the um, in, in the um, study is that the group that thought they were being prayed for um, had a higher expectation, put a higher expectation on themselves, which uh, had a higher, um, which made, made them have a higher amount of stress. Um, maybe they're thinking about the sins of their life or something, and they're, they're trying to work, work things out. It's quite a traumatic experience experience um, going through heart surgery and then uh, as a result of that stress their heart um, was was pumping harder and it couldn't recover like it could with the groups that didn't know they were being prayed for so i thought that was an interesting experiment i'll link it in the description well, that consciousness itself faith and belief are f f formative foundational necessary components of reality in the way that reality yep. is expressed no 
we can make the claim that faith and belief have um, can play a role in change in changing objective reality, or I, I should say subjective reality. So. Um, for example, if you've got a positive attitude when you go into a test, you might fare better than if you have a negative attitude. That doesn't mean that there's goblins underneath the table, imaginary invisible goblins that are doing your test for you. It just means that you, your cognitive abilities might work better in that situation. Or if you've got hope for the future, um, you may may have a better chance of um, your body metabolizing the minerals and things that you need. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of talking out of my ass here, but your body might function in a, in a, in a better way, in a, in a healthy way, less stress, et cetera. Um, we can't make the um, jump from placebo to therefore faith and belief are paramount to um, the entire world, like as it exists, that doesn't work. And realized and to foreclose that reality mm. is um, uh, hubristic and sort of lacks optimism and open-mindedness. It's, that, that seems to me that that's telling us something fundamental. Yeah, I, I really agree with that, Russell. M- 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 men and women are, are holistic. We are mind, clearly. We're a body. But there's also a spiritual component, whatever you take that to mean. So whenever you have science that's devolved of the individual, the, the role of the clinician really is to put that individual back in. So, you know, when I, when I, when I go to a patient in, in pain, I, I'll hold the hand and I'll be with them. I'll, I'll come alongside them. But looking at... I do agree um, with what Dr. John Campbell is saying in regards to there is more than just like touching feeling, like subjective experiences matter a lot. I disagree with his claim about the spiritual though. Even if he tries to fluff it up uh, in, in, in whatever, you know, um, blurry, um, stretched out perspective he has, I don't think it. you can call it spiritual. If I was to ask you to define spiritual and ask you to define it that in a way that could be separated from like an from a deeply uh, a deeply held emotional response to something it would be a hard thing to do uh and then you know if you were to ask evidence for the spiritual you, you fall into all these these kind of problems look at something supernatural or spiritual as soon as you can understand it it no longer becomes supernatural or spiritual it's like a um it's like an issue with methodological naturalism so um, yeah, so it, it kind of becomes hard to have these conversations around faith and science because of things like that. And from a much broader point of view, science really, modern science, I feel, does inform spirituality in, in a way that's never been informed before. So maybe if we just take a couple of examples. If we take one example as you as an individual or me as an individual, um, uh, without being too crude about it, your father and my father were quite capable of producing three or four hundred million individual reproductive cells per day. Okay, so let's do some research on this John Campbell, okay? Campbell made false claims about the antiparasitic ivermectin. Oh, come on. Come on. Okay, all right. Shows to consider. Science can just show us this bewildering array of possibilities just in terms of the individual. And yet here we are, you and me, both experiencing consciousness. And more than that, to an extent, to an extent, uh, understanding, if not experiencing each other's consciousness, because because we're communicating. And and I I can tell that that, that you're understanding things that I'm saying. So so it ties up as the in the individual. But then when we look at science, it also ties up into the whole nature of, of, of the universe without being too grandiose about it. Because if you take any parameter in science, take, take any science, so t- take, take, you take biology, t- take, take geology. If you change any aspect of geology, pretty well any aspect of geology, you don't have a stable planet. So if the Earth's a little bit further to the, from the sun or closer to the sun or the moon isn't the right mass and the moon isn't at the right distance, and the amount of uranium in the Earth's crust is <sighs> so. This is this is like an argument for God as well. Um, what's it called? <laughs> the the argument that is like currently used by creationists or or or, um, or or certain religious people is they'll say that everything on Earth is perfect. Like without like if you could um, imagine like little dials where the Earth is like perfectly uh, tuned in with like all these things need to be absolutely perfect. And if and if it didn't exist, there'd be no life. And that somehow means that there is a God. It's kind of like, how do we determine that we're not just um, very lucky, you know? And um, so we don't know. And we also don't know about abiogenesis or anything. This is, um, anyway, 
I don't know how this is relevant, but I could tell that's he, he was yeah. In any aspect of geology, pretty well any aspect of geology, you don't have a stable planet. So if the Earth's a little bit further to the, from the sun or closer to the sun or the moon isn't the right mass and the moon isn't at the right distance and the amount of uranium in the Earth's crust is not right to give the right amount of plate tectonics and the, the amount of water in the oceans is not right to give the hydro cycle. If you change anything, you don't have a long term stable planet and therefore you don't you don't have human beings. So we depend on everything in physics, everything in chemistry, everything in geology, everything in biology being exactly as it is, or you and me are not experiencing this, whatever this is, this consciousness now that we are currently experiencing. And the more we learn about science, the more improbable it looks that all these things could just arise spontaneously as, as random chance. Oh, I knew he was going to an argument. <laughs> So it's just a whole fascinating area where yeah, no, people it's talk, fascinating. tend to talk about a religion science as if they're in separate mm. boxes, or even worse, that, that they are that they are opposed to each other. Whereas to me, um, the more you learn about science, the more it leaves for the sheer wonder of, of this phenomena we call consciousness. There you mm. go, you're learning well something. Well done. Well done. I didn't learn anything. What I learned, I, no, I did learn some things. I learned that um, that as you're nodding here with your blank um, look on your face, because you, if you take have any absolutely parameter. no idea what he's talking about. That's what I learned. As you're yeah. nodding away Earth's here, crust is not you're right probably thinking of something else. Like, because come on, man, you didn't even know what a double blind experiment is. Not to, I mean, fantastic comedian, great actor, but it, 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 come on. Uh, another thing is uh, what Dr. Uh, Dr. John Campbell is doing here is he's, he's basically saying, look at the trees. How can you deny that this didn't come from God or this didn't come from some amazing, you know, overlord or something? Um, this is just such a bad argument for the existence of God or the existence of spirituality. You're basically saying... Um, it's called, it's like the, the God of the gaps. It's like there's the thunder on the mountain. We're two Greeks sitting down, um, at a table and there's thunder on the mountain. And one of them says, what else could it be? Hear how loud that thunder is. It must be Zeus. Well, how about the answer is we don't know. We don't know what consciousness is. We don't even know if you, if consciousness is even a, a sensical idea to even put out there. We, we don't know. We, we don't know almost anything about consciousness. We know people can be conscious when they like wake up from surgery or something or they or they can become unconscious by getting knocked out but we don't really know what that even means we don't know if it's just absolutely complex um chemicals bashing around in our head we don't know we don't know if everything is, is conscious first but because we don't know doesn't mean we can start making up stuff that makes us feel good and feels justified that's, that's not really how science works I remember when I visited uh, the, a faith and science talk when I was first questioning my faith. Um, it was the year 2016, maybe, may um, the Brisbane Science uh, Festival. Uh, and there were, was a Buddhist on stage, a Buddhist scientist, a Muslim scientist, a Christian scientist, an Orthodox scientist, and maybe another type of Christian. I need, need to throw a few Christians in there. Or maybe another type of Muslim. And they were all claiming that there was no problem between their faith and science, despite the fact that all their faiths were mutually exclusive, meaning that one could not be true if the other was true, right? So really what they're saying is um, my faith is just like not, it doesn't really affect my science. Anyway, the last person to be asked this question was A.C. Grayling, and he was an atheist, and he said, I realize now that I've come here to just disagree with everyone and everyone laughed. And he said, he doesn't think science and faith can mix. And the reason is, is because faith starts from the presupposition of believing something where science does everything it can to remove as much bias as it can so that we can uh, investigate the objective world with as little bias as possible. So if you're making up um, terms with no evidence to try and, um, explain away emotional feelings like spirituality, like souls, like um, like the complexity of life and the um, fine tuning of the planet, etc. If you're making up these things and saying they point to a God, why can you not say the same thing about giant alien lizard overlords or the great blue orb or the flying spaghetti monster or aliens or a simulation? 
And because all of these things can be justified with those same arguments, those exact same arguments, and, and they could be justified based on that assumption. If you can justify one, you have to be able to justify the others. Then it makes, like, it, 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 the argument just falls apart. Another good one is faith. Is faith a reliable pathway to truth? If faith can lead me to Yahweh and you to Zeus or Allah or, or Krishna, that doesn't that demonstrate that faith is an unreliable pathway to truth? Isn't it more likely that people just don't understand things yet and that we're learning these things and we do that at the moment with the scientific method because it's been proven to be the most rely consistently reliable thing to use? That's, that, I mean, yeah. Thanks for watching. Oh. 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 Oh.